So the scene recorded in our lesson today is the reason why we remember the name of this Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. In his banter with both Jewish leaders and Jesus, he asks a number of questions. And you know, we've said this year that Jesus also asks a number of questions, but not because he needs information, but he asks questions to help individuals examine their hearts and even their convictions. Pilate asks questions, not because he wants to learn necessarily, but because he seeks to manipulate circumstances to fall in his favor. What charges are you bringing against this man? Are you king of the Jews? Am I a Jew? And then the infamous question in verse 38, what is truth? You know, that question, what is truth, is actually as relevant now in 2024 as it was at the moment that Pilate asked it. <laughs> when Jesus made the statement that the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Jesus is truth, right? He's declared that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And truth is on trial here in this lesson. Truth is on trial. And truth, in many ways, is on trial in our day. You know, I spent some time with a young person yesterday and the conversation, naturally, because it was on my mind, kind of went to this very topic, the topic of truth. This young person's idea of what truth is was, was the way he thinks. If it makes sense to him, then it's truth. And he is a product of our culture. He feels content, and okay with living his truth. He feels no pressure at this moment to find the truth. His truth is adequate. So let's think for a little, uh, for a few minutes on how to define what is truth. And one way we can do that is saying what truth isn't. Truth is not simply whatever works. Lies can achieve a goal and still be a lie. Truth is not simply true because a group of people decide it makes sense. Truth is not what makes people feel good. Truth is not defined by sincerity. You can believe a lie with your whole heart, and it's still a lie. And truth is not what is approved of by the majority. We could come up with more uh, ways to think about that, but that's a beginning. And the Greek word used in our Bible in verse 37 of chapter 18 is a Greek word that ref refers to divine revelation. Jesus says his purpose was to come to earth and testify to the truth. And the Greek word, so divine revelation, and it is can literally be, um, it's related to a word that means what cannot be hidden, what cannot be hidden. Truth is telling it like it is, whether it's popular, whether it's, it's going to achieve the goal you're looking for, whatever. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Throughout his whole earthly life, he would tell it like it is. He did that with each and every interaction that he had with people. Just a few 
um, examples from the beginning of John's Gospel. John 1.14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1.17, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. John 3, 21, but he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Jesus is the truth. He proclaims truth. Our Bibles give us divine revelation of what is true. So postmodernism says there isn't any truth. Can't be found. Pluralism says every person's truth is valid. So live your truth. But what the Bible says about truth is our big idea this morning. Everyone must personally respond to the truth of Jesus and his eternal reign. Everyone must personally respond to the truth of Jesus and his eternal reign. The truth of Jesus is not the variable, but the response of man is. The truth of Jesus doesn't change, doesn't waver, doesn't get revi revised by the culture. It is not the variable. The variable is the response of individuals. So um, the outline has two divisions. Uh, first, verses 28 to 38, the indifference to truth. And then the second division, rejection of truth. 1839 to 1916. So open your Bibles with me and we'll start on division one, indifference. When we left off last week, Peter had denied knowing Jesus in the courtyard of the high priest. At the same time, Jesus was questioned before Annas. Well, now it's early in the morning and the Jewish leaders take Jesus to the Roman governor's palace. In verse 28, the Jews will not enter the palace to avoid becoming ceremonially unclean before the Passover. This is another example of the religious who make a big deal over externals while at the same time tolerating an unclean heart. The desire to murder an innocent man is to ignore the truth of the command, do not murder. Twisted devotion of legalists who expect to please God as they do not physically enter a Gentile's re residence. The charge they have against Jesus is blasphemy, but that's a religious charge. So you have, so they must find a reason for a civil or a political offense so that Pilate will execute him. So the question comes, what are the charges? Verse 30, if he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. You know, this whole, a lot of this communication in this section seems to sound a little sarcastic. It's adversarial, kind of like, don't worry about the details of what he's done. Just know he's guilty according to us. Under Roman rule, Jewish leaders did not have the authority to put anyone to death. They expected Pilate to confirm their decision and sentence Jesus. In verses 31 to 32, Pilate doesn't quickly play along and suggests they judge him themselves. So it becomes increasingly clear that neither the corrupt Jews or the Roman governor are in control of these events. Neither want responsibility. Um, if the Jewish leadership were to put him to death themselves, he would have been stoned to death according to their law but that would be illegal under Roman law. 
Jesus had to be crucified under Roman jurisprudence. All this coming together in a way that proves the truth that God is moving the chess pieces, right? He is the one who's writing the story. Um, prophecy will be fulfilled. Even Jesus himself said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. So Pilate goes inside and asks another question of Jesus. Are you king of the Jews? Well, if Jesus were to say yes, then that would enter into a political, potential a political offense, to pose a threat to Roman power and could even label him as an insurrectionist. But we know that these are false charges and exactly the opposite of things that Jesus had said. Jesus had said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Pilate goes, uh, Pilate goes on. Or Jesus asks, is this your idea that I'm king of the Jews? Or did someone tell you that? How quickly do you and I accept what other people tell us is true? Did someone tell you that? Or is this your idea? Jesus is asking a question he knows the answer to because he's giving Pilate an opportunity to examine himself. What's your motive underlying this? He's giving him a chance to think for himself rather than to be told what to think by other people. How do we discern the credibility of the people that we listen to on social media? How do we discern the credibility of people that even we listen to in the church? You know, I'm on a lot of these health, you know, healthy eating and all this. And so I get these reels that come through my social media and sometimes you just wonder. Somebody puts on a white coat and says they're a doctor and they tell you they've got the supplement that's going to make you the best version of yourself. It's like, how do I know who this person is? Am I going to listen to them and take what they say as truth? Jesus asks questions of Pilate and us so that we think, so that we think, Pilate, was this your own idea or is it just something you heard? And the response in verse 35, am I a Jew? It's as if he's saying, I don't really care. I'm not interested whether you're king of the Jews Jewish matters um, are not important to me. It's defensive, but it also portrays a level of disinterest. Your own people have handed you over. What is it you've done? Jesus hadn't answered the question, are you king of the Jews? But when he asked them, your own people have handed you over. Jesus Answers in verse 36. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to protect my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. So you are a king, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Now Jesus answers a question, but again, his answer is a challenge to Pilate to think. Yes, I have a kingdom, but it's not the kind of kingdom you think. A kingdom not of this world, not part of the world system. It's not driven by worldly authority. I, its king does not receive authority from any human source. If his kingdom was of this world, 
he would not have been captured so easily. What Jesus is saying is that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, which are interchangeable terms, is much more than any kingdom on earth. It's characterized by God's sovereign rule and authority throughout all of history. From the creation of the world, his rule began. He spoke the world into existence. He spoke and the world was flooded when it had become exceedingly wicked, but he remembered Noah. By his command, kingdoms come and go. By his direction, Jesus was born, lived, and would die on the cross, which was prophesied hundreds of years before it happened, exactly as it is written. The kingdom of God describes both a present reality and a glorious future reality, where Satan, sin, and death are removed from earth, and every knee will bow in worship. The present kingdom of God is ruled by King Jesus, and it is not in any way or at any time subject to the authority of man. When we pray your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, we're asking God to extend his kingdom on earth as the truth of Jesus is proclaimed and people embrace and submit to the truth of the gospel. They submit to the God's rule and reign in their heart. Believers stand with Jesus on the side of his truth and trust him in the present and the future. We live in his presence and under his authority with our eyes focused on our eternal hope. So verse 38, Pilate's response is not really to learn the answer to the question. He says, what is truth? more like sarcasm from the heart of a skeptic. What makes you the source of truth? People might say that to you. Well, why? Just because you think the Bible says this is true. Skeptic. Even though Pilate, he was basically saying, there's no truth from you that matters to me. There's no truth in our Bibles that matter to some young people, some skeptics in our lives. Doesn't matter. Even though Pilate was indifferent to the truth that Jesus offered, at the same time, conflicted because he admits that he could find no guilt in Jesus. So a principle that we can take here is the eternal truth that guides our lives today is that Jesus reigns over all. An eternal truth that guides our lives today is that Jesus reigns over all. Whether you believe it or not, he reigns. Whether you believe it or not, he is king over his kingdom. He said he came into the world to testify to the truth and everyone on the side of truth listens to me. So can you say that your posture when the truth Jesus speaks to you is a challenge is one of submission, surrender, or is it one that responds with sarcasm or indifference? Does he rule and reign before any other allegiance in your daily life? We can say we stand with Jesus and his truth. We can acknowledge that his kingdom is not of this world. But does he really reign and rule over any other allegiance in our life, over our calendars, over our priorities, over our activities, over our relationships. Pilate responded with an edge, defensive and curt. When the Spirit comes to convict you about something, are you tempted to deflect away what makes you uncomfortable? I don't like that truth. I don't like that part of your truth, and I'm going to ignore it. Deflect away what makes you uncomfortable. 
when we read about examples of rebellion or pride in our Bibles, it's easy to shake our heads or wag our finger and say, oh, they should have known better. Pilate, he was standing right in front of you, the truth. We might wonder how they could be so blind, but what if these things are recorded also for the purpose of us to see ourselves? In a little bit in Pilate, a little bit in Peter, we see ourselves and we take heed, we take warning. So division two, rejection of truth. We go from indifference to rejection. Pilate seems to be confused, a bit indecisive. He doesn't want to stand with the truth of Jesus, but he admits he finds no basis for a charge. He wants to release him because he wants to, not for the good of Jesus, but he wants to remove himself from this tense situation and even potentially dangerous situation. But at the same time, he wants to appease the crowd. So Pilate employs the tradition that a Passover, a prisoner is to be released. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? Maybe he hoped, maybe he assumed they would say yes, but they cry out for Barabbas. Barabbas is a known robber and insurrectionist. One commentary called him a notorious criminal. He wasn't just a minor offender. He, he, was, he was bad. <laughs> He was guilty and then some. But Pilate hid behind this custom and hoped it would give him the opportunity to um, release Jesus. So the next thing that he does to try and appease the crowd is unbelievable. It's unbelievable brutality and cruelty. But he thinks he's going to satisfy the, the crowd, and so he orders Jesus to be flogged. To be flogged was a cruel compromise. Flogging was referred to as the pre-death death because it was such a horrifying experience. The person was taken, their hands were tied behind their backs. They were bent over and attached to a pole. And soldiers would take short wooden poles with these strips of leather on them. At the end of the strips of leather would be pieces of lead or bone, sharp shards of material. And they would unleash with severe fury onto the prisoner. And many times, people didn't actually make it to crucifixion because they couldn't endure the flogging. The body at this time could be so torn and lacerated that historians say that the internal organs would be visible and exposed. It's beyond understanding. I find him innocent. I find no basis for a charge. Let's flog him. The mockery continued with the crown of thorns and the purple royal robe. They taunted him. And I, you know, when you read this, this is an example of the depraved death that sinful man is capable of. How far it can go. And in the context of all this depravity, this ugliness, stands the one who is absolutely innocent. He doesn't resist. He is righteous. He is majestic. He is King Jesus. King of the universe. The one who spoke the world into existence and who upholds the universe willingly subjects himself to this kind of treatment. I'm going to just read. Um, Once more, Pilate comes out and said to the Jews gathered here, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know. I find no basis for a charge against him. Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns, the purple robe, and Pilate said, Here's the man. 
As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, crucify him. They weren't appeased. They weren't satisfied. They wanted his death. No charge. Yet the people cry for crucifixion of the king of the universe, God incarnate, the one who could call 12 legions of angels to his aid. But he doesn't do it. Why not? was for the salvation of sinners. It was for our eternal good. You and I who constantly go astray, you and I who by nature are indifferent to the things of God, we're disinterested sometimes in who he is and what he's done. We're more interested in what we want to do. He's standing there, having been flogged in a robe with a crown of thorns, and he's thinking about us. And it's our names that are engraved on his, the palm of his hands. Jesus had said to his disciples earlier, the Son of Man must suffer many things, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin, innocent, to be sin for us, so that in him we might have the righteousness of God. Now in verse 7, the Jewish leaders insist, we have a law, according to our law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. And that is where our Pilate's fear begins to escalate. The flogging didn't satisfy the crowd. And now the Jews bring to Pilate's attention that Jesus claimed to be God's son. So Pilate goes back to him, where do you come from? And Jesus is silent. Pilate, don't you realize I have the power to put you to death or set you free? And Jesus says, no, you don't. <laughs> you don't have any power. You don't have anything that is not given to you from above. Jesus is preparing to finish the work that God the Father gave him to do. And from then on, Pilate tries to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders keep shouting and shouting and louder and louder, and they bring in Caesar, which they know will strike more fear in Pilate if he is in trouble with the Roman higher-ups. The same Jews who accuse Jesus of blasphemy now themselves become blasphemers, proclaiming Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. And your religious leaders... Pilate finally gave in to the crowd shouting and demands. He gave in to his fear, and instead of recognizing Jesus' position as Lord and King and submitting to it, he gives in to the fear of man. As the governing political ruler of this area, he could have released Jesus. He could have believed the truth of Jesus and stood with him. When Jesus said, the power you have was given you from above, Pilate could have responded with reverent fear of God, but instead he rejected the truth Jesus offered, gave in to the fear of man, he gave in to self-protection. His final decision was to reject the truth of Jesus and hand him over to be crucified. Here's the principle uh, from this section. Rejecting the truth Jesus offers out of self-interest leads to eternal death. Rejecting the truth Jesus offers out of self-interest leads to eternal death. Self-interest or self-preservation is only temporary. But the consequences, the, the consequences of rejecting Jesus and his truth is forever. 
Jesus challenges our selfish, worldly ideas to get what we could never attain for ourselves. Peace with God. It is out of this great scene full of evil, injustice, betrayal, and brutality that will come the work of God to accomplish and provide salvation for the world. We don't deserve it. He stands in our place and absorbs the full wrath of God. Let's pray. Father, this is heavy and this is serious and you've recorded it because you want us to read it over and over and over so that we don't ever forget the price that was paid for our eternal good. Teach us to be women who are rock solid in our resolve to stand with Jesus and his truth in a world that is fast turning from him. And so we, we want to know you more. We want to please you more. We want to be solid in our convictions. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit that makes it live in our hearts. In Jesus' name, 